Hey everybody, welcome to the Moochies, second annual Moochies. We got a lot to review here. It's been an interesting year, a good year for the channel. Highs and lows, and we're gonna go over all the highlights as well. As at the end here, we'll uh, award the Moochies. And you guys remember the Moochies are given for guests with the most views in a single episode and guest of the year. So we'll do that at the end. So right now, I would like to introduce my co-host for this lecture. Hey, everybody. Happy New Year. This is Mooch, the uh, beautiful Carrie Carroll. We have been married for 36 and a half years. Here's our wedding in Virginia Beach when I was in the VF32. All the swordsmen are uh, pilots from the other two, except the guy on the left here is Mike Overson, or on the right is Mike Overson. So he was a graduate in that class of mine. And then you see my brother, he's the Marine, Marine uh, Staff and CO. Um, and so uh, that was a great day. So Carrie's dad was also a naval aviator, a A6 pilot. So both of the grandparents, for our boys were granddads or they were, were a six pilots. So Gary, tell the folks where you work currently. Well, I work um, at the Na United States Naval Academy Alumni Association, supporting the, um, the United States Naval Academy and their parents and the grads and everybody who's involved in the, uh, in the whole uh, interest in the Naval Academy. So I work in membership, I do engagement, reaching out and um, I love my job. It's great, it's great, so. Come by and see us sometime. And you guys just moved into a new building. Yes, new we moved building. into the the new Flugel um, Alumni Center um, this summer. Uh, a huge building, uh, which really is, is is set up to engage the alumni and and midshipmen and everybody who um, has an interest in the organization. So it's really exciting, and we're really happy to be there. Plus, your commute is not very long. Mm, Two point one yeah. miles. Yeah, yeah, not too bad. No complaint. So Carrie was a fantastic Navy spouse. We were in four squadrons together, and uh, you know, our last tour about to on the channel was at the Naval Academy, living on the on what we call the yard there. Um, so uh, we had uh, quite a ride, and uh, she's been my best friend and my partner, particularly with this enterprise. Uh, so it's great to have her here working the games of the comments for this particular live stream. As I've mentioned before on some of the other live streams, I want to make sure I can pay attention to the comments. So Carrie will be working the comments here. Um, so including putting guys in the penalty box. Uh, so uh, we'll have a steady stream of comments happening. Uh, so Carrie. Uh, they're saying you're right. echoing really badly. Okay. You got a bad echo. Oh, I put a bad echo. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's going to carry mute her. her. All right. So it shouldn't be echoing now. Um, so, all right. So Carrie will be working the comments. Yeah, I think it's lagging. How is it now? How does it sound now? Better. Okay. There we go. How, how are we sounding? I think what we were hearing was the echo of Carrie's laptop. She's located right over here. <laughs> okay, so um, you can take away that comment that the audio is very horrible. Um, all right, guys. So the this is the anniversary of the channel, um, and. Uh, Take that comment. Um, so this is the third anniversary of the channel. I, I started the channel uh, this time in in 2020, and so um, the first episode that I had that sort of set the direction of the channel was the uh, Goose's death episode. So let's take a quick look at that episode. So. You know, here I am in the attic. The, the amplifier is in a different place. Different pictures behind me. This is before I actually used uh, 
any post-production stuff. So it's just me holding this large model, wooden model of, of the Tomcat from my VF32 days, my first deployment. And uh, so this kind of sat there for about three weeks and I'm sorry, for about four months, rather, not three weeks, just sat there, 40 views. And then in mid uh, August, I'm sorry, mid April of 2021, that episode had 95,000 views in a single day. And so before that, I'd had maybe a thousand uh, for, for an episode. And uh, thank you, Jeff, for the super chat, patron Jeff Skiver and your tour director for Moochapalooza in the event you're going to attend Moochapalooza in July. More on that later. So that episode changed the direction of the channel, or focused, let's just say focused the direction of the channel. So I became a YouTube partner. Um, and so this is the second full year since I became a, a YouTube partner. And so, um, Let's take a look at the numbers for this year in terms of, of the, the metrics. So you can see there, we made almost 176,000 new subscribers. We went over 500,000 subscribers, which uh, was a milestone. If you told me three years ago that that's where we'd, where we'd be, I wouldn't have believed it. 30, almost 35 million views. And then you can see the others, millions of likes, thousands of comments, hundreds of thousands of comments, hundreds of thousands of shares. So this year, published 97 videos, 18 shorts, and we did 16 live streams. Uh, but that doesn't include this one. So actually, we did 17 live streams. I just read the total views of the entire channel, but you can see the breakdown by format. 34 and a half million views on the videos, two and a, two and 7 million live stream views, and then 1.2 million shorts. And as you guys know, I don't do a whole lot of shorts. This was kind of an interesting stat in the, uh, in the metrics in the back end. So you can see the number of impressions is over half a billion, meaning more than half a billion YouTube viewers were exposed to my thumbnails. And then that distills down to 30 or 24.3 million views from those impressions. So that's that's actually a pretty good ratio uh, in in the, uh, the digital media business. But that number just kind of blew me away. That half a billion, over half a billion folks um, had, uh, had seen the thumbnails, which is a lesson in doing good thumbnails, obviously. And then here's the year over year views by day. So the blue is this year and the purple was last year. So you can see the spikes from last year, that spike in on day 62, that's when the war in Ukraine kicked off. And I started doing both pre-recorded episodes and live streams. And this is when we introduced uh, Justin Bronk to the, to the channel and, and he was very popular with uh, with uh, with the guests or with the viewers. Um, I'm hearing the audio is suboptimal. How, how's the audio sounding? Maybe when I lean into it, it's suboptimal, but uh, hopefully it's sounding okay to you guys. Um, so then this year we had basically two periods of spikes. Yeah, good idea. Okay, I'll sit back. How's it sounding now? I don't want to like, keep going. It sounds terrible. Four by five. Okay. That's good enough. Thank you, Pete. Uh, so it's just appreciate it. All right. So two spikes this year. First one was the Chinese spy balloon. And then you can see we have highs and lows. And then spike in the fall, and that is associated with the Israel-Hamas war and the other current events episodes we've been doing, including one that I launched this morning uh, that already has 
nearly 600,000 views. Uh, so been a lot of interest in current events episodes. So overall, you can see we did more than 10, 10 million, rather, 10 million, almost 11 million more views this year than last year. So another thing that we did this year was we took the, uh, the, the show uh, on the road. And so originally, I was hoping that we would use this RV. And, and so there's a app called Outdoorsy, which is kind of like Airbnb for RVs. And I designed that logo, had the local fast signs. The folks are really cool. It's all two blocks away. Uh, they designed my booth. I'll show you what the booth looks like. We took out the hook and, and we used actually at, at the Oceana Air Show. But we had intended to go to the Oceana Air Show with this RV and I was going to have Hoser and Paco Chirucci and Virus and some of the other gang. And we were going to shoot content back and forth, do multiple stops. So the, the day before I'm going to pick up this RV, the owner calls me and says, hey, you, you can't have the RV. I'm like, oh, this is a problem because I actually signed a contract with the organiz organizers of the Oceana Air Show. Um, so I was committed, not that that was a problem. But, you know, signed the contract and, uh, you know, had to go. So he's like, I'm sorry, the, the, the RV was in an accident and it's not available. In fact, he said, I called you before I called the, uh, the auto body place. So I immediately called Fast Signs and said, hey, here's a question. Can the logo, the wrap, just like you wrap a taxi cab or a bus or, or a promo vehicle, the wrap, will that wrap fit on a Toyota 4x4 or a 4Runner, which is our family car? And they're like, I don't know. We're going to have to call you back. So they called back and they said, yes, it will. So long story short, wound up making the family truckster into the team vehicle, which worked out great. So uh, we took the show on the road. And the, the first place we, we went with the, the team vehicle was the Oceana Air Show. So did a number of episodes there, including we were allowed to sit down with the commander of Naval Air Forces Atlantic, Vice Admiral, I'm sorry, Rear Admiral Verissimo. So let me play a brief excerpt from that episode. And it, it was kind of uh, foreshadowing. In fact, what he says proved not to be true uh, with respect to the USS Gerald R. Ford, the new current events. And we have some breaking news about Ford's status that I'll, I'll put out at the end of this, uh, this sound here. So here's a, a lecture from his appearance back in September. So how's Ford doing on their first real Ford, deployment? Ford's doing well. First they did the uh, uh, service retain the two month deployment. Now they're doing a full five and a half month deployment. We're gonna turn them around in a relatively short period of time with some, some yard work and they're gonna do a third or a second real deployment if you wanna go by a, 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 a GFM deployment in the not too distant future. Ford is meeting the mark. We're learning about what supplies they need and those operation centers, those maintenance centers are really helping us to Fine and narrow our focus on what the key components and, and uh, training is. So emails, the electronic catapults are, are working. Working well. And and so sortie generation rates are good. Uh, how about those weapons elevators, which was working well, boo. working well, and, and we're working JFK right now to get her out more quickly, taking those lessons learned from Ford onto the next carrier, JFK, John F. Kennedy, working their weapons elevators ahead of time so they're ready to go. So how's all right? So obviously, what he put out there about the schedule of Ford didn't prove to be true. Ford has been on cruise for uh, several months beyond five months, but the breaking news that I'm I'm referring to is uh, that the um, Ford or the Department of Defense has just announced that Ford is is going to be coming home pretty soon. The other 
way that they're doing the work around about the fact that they won't have a carry in the Gulf yet is now they have re-aggregated the Bataan ARG. And as we've put out in a, a number of episodes that the, the amphibious ready group was separated. So Carter Hall and Bataan were in the Red Sea or Persian Gulf. And the third ship in the ARG, which is the Mesa Verde, was in the Met. And so now Bataan and Carter Hall have transited the Suez Canal north and they're back in the Met. So now you have a full ARG to cover whatever contingencies might arise as a function of the israel hamas Hezbollah conflict, meaning if we have to do a non-combatant evacuation, that's what they're there for, meaning get Americans out of the uh, hotspots if need be. So Ford is headed back, which is great for that crew. They've done their their job and it's time to get some other folks in there. Plus Ford has some maintenance availabilities, as you heard Admiral Verissimo mention, that uh, you can't slide them to the right too much because they're going to put some new mods on this newest carrier and then send her right back on deployment. So that was a great opportunity. And you saw we were there at the Oceana Air Show. The folks, the organizers invited us to go down there and it proved to be a real great time. And we did a, a bunch of episodes while we were down there. Hoser Miller, who you guys know, a regular guest on the channel, uh, manned the booth with me. And we had a lot of well-wishers. And I intend to do that air show again next year. It'll be in, in September. Uh, so more to follow on that. But we definitely had a good time. In fact, we want to do more road shows in the coming year. And hopefully we can actually use a, a real RV uh, coming up. Although that uh, Forerunner is working, working pretty good. So the other thing we got to do is go to Tailhook. And as a life member of, of Tailhook, I'm very proud to show the channel colors at the Tailhook convention. This was the final one that they're going to do at the Nugget. Next year, it's going to be at the uh, uh, the Grand Sierra Resort. It's a, a bigger, glitzier casino resort than the Nugget, although uh, we, we have a lot of love for the Nugget. They were there for the Tailhook Association when, uh, when nobody else was back in the uh, mid-90s. But the organization has outgrown the nugget. So we had a booth and you can see the, what the booth looks like. We, again, a lot of folks came by the booth. We gave out a lot of t-shirts, a lot of koozies, met a lot of folks and did a number of episodes, including one with the air boss, Vice Admiral Kenny Weitzel, who was a squadron mate of mine in the early nineties. We were instructors at VF 101 together he went on to be a Super Hornet guy and then went on to be the commander of Naval Air Forces Pacific, a.k.a. the Air Boss. So he had a great tenure, some challenging times, some successes, uh, so forth and so on. And so uh, we were able to do the final interview with him uh, in the booth there. So watch this. The road is coming for you. You're going to have to leave the clubhouse, as yeah. we say. What emotions, as you've had some time to conceive of this, obviously yeah. you're the busiest man yeah. on the planet, as evidenced by all the things you get called away to do here, yeah. um, but what what emotions are hitting you as you uh, think about the next chapter? Uh, I, I go back to the first squadron. I go back to us as JOs, and you know, it has seemed like a blur as fast as it went by because you go back every single time I think about what's going to happen on September 7th. I think about what happened on in October 24 of 1984 when I gave the gunnery sergeant a salute down in Pensacola. There is a, how in the world did I get here? You know, I look at the COs and great mentors. I, I looked at the quality of life that we had. I looked at the first squadron. You know, you and I stayed in because of our, you know, the, the bond, the relationships, and the first squadron piece. So there's some trepidation of cutting the tie with the, by calling yourself active duty. Uh, and is that all to also cut the tie with your, uh, you know, with your friends? I, I think that's the opportunity now to get back and revive some of those, some of that friendships. Uh, the business part, just like you said, the busyness side, they, there'll be, there'll be no problem. Uh, 
going to a full sprint off the podium on <laughs> September 7th and running away and then putting money back into the family bank and, uh, and uh, some bucket list stuff, uh, stuff to do. But more importantly, knowing that uh, you know, there was consequence to every tour that we did, there was some value added, uh, and everything, the one thing we hoped to do after every tour, we left the place better than we found it. And I, that's, I'm, a, well, I'm not going to have a problem on the afternoon of September 7th. Yeah. Uh, I know you, I know that's true. <laughs> well, I'm Kenny Weitzel, my good friend. Thanks, Super Mooch. proud of you. Thanks, Thanks for giving us some time today and good luck with the next chapter. Thanks, Mooch. Love you, brother. Love you too. So that was uh, very cool to speak with him. He was super busy out there at Hook, and, and I almost had to literally tackle him to get him to sit down with us. Uh, but the the fact that guys like Emma Whitesell and Emma Verissimo are willing, whether I know them or not, the fact they're willing to sit down and, and spend some time with the channel is a tribute to the support you guys have given us. So their PAOs run interference. They're not going to just do something if it doesn't have some impact or some potential to get the word out there. Uh, so I thank you for your support. Another manifestation of that, in fact, maybe the biggest one this year, was my interview with the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen. Now, Admiral Mullen and I served together on the George Washington when I was CAG Ops, and he was what we used to call a battle group commander. I've known him for some years. But again, his calendar is super busy, and he's not going to sit down with just anybody. I mean, he's been on 60 Minutes, for crying out loud, and he's on Meet the Press all the time. So the fact he was willing to sit down with me in spite of the fact that we know each other is, again, a tribute to how this channel's growing and the cred that it has uh, as a function of that. So this was the longest episode I've ever done by an hour. It was two and a half. It is two and a half hours long. And I was concerned that that would be sort of a showstopper at a glance for, for viewers, but it absolutely has not. It's at 120, 130,000 views, which is awesome. And if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. But there's one part where he talks about the bin Laden raid in, in great detail. So let me play you a, an excerpt of that. I'll tell you that when I walked in there, the helicopter was already down. The first guy I looked at was Gates because Gates had been in the sit room for the uh, tragic events associated with uh, Desert One in 1980 for the Iranian hostage rescue and certainly had some reservations about this operation because, in my view, it's not because he's told me this, but because uh, of what he went through back then. And I just wondered, man, what, me, what must be going on in his head. Uh, that said, that helicopter pilot, in my view, uh, and we talked about the rehearsal, but that helicopter pilot saved the mission. Uh, and because he was able to land that helicopter in that position. Uh, and with all the rehearsals, and there were many, including this dress rehearsal I spoke of, uh, the, it's, it's a reminder that uh, you gotta train as hard as you can uh, and no matter what you do, Murphy shows up. Uh, and in this case, Murphy was in an overheated compound in terms of the air that was available in which to fly once the helicopter got over the wall and it was too hot and he didn't have enough air to keep the helicopter up. Uh, so he managed to essentially land it as many people have seen it. Uh, there was obviously great, immediate great concern. Uh, nobody actually in the sit room here, uh, other than just sort of holding their breath. And uh, McRaven, who was on speaker, uh, uh, said, "Don't worry about this. We've had, we've planned for something like this." So amazing insights, and that whole interview is full of stuff like that. So if you haven't seen it, check it out and. Uh, that's kind of cool to have sort of, a, let's call it a poor man's oral history as part of the the, the channel catalog. Uh, really great stuff. And I thank Emma Mullen for for spending the time with us. It was, we had, I ran out of batteries. I had, 
three batteries and we ran out. I was like, I didn't think we would be spending three hours, you know, and uh, of shooting to create a two and a half hour episode. Uh, so we came back that afternoon and, and finished up. In fact, if you look at the last sort of quarter of of uh, the episode, you can see that the the he's fo he's framed just a little differently. Um, and and so anyway, that that I'm glad it worked out because that was really a special episode. Another guy that I've known for a long time who has a cool story to tell, and again, these folks are not going to just tell it anywhere, is Heater Heatley. And so Heater and I, and I had tried to do this like a year and a half ago, and we shot it kind of in the same area where we did the one uh, that you may have seen a, a couple months ago uh, in front of the F-14 there in, on the Naval Academy grounds. But the audio was terrible. And so I figured out a, a different audio situation using different lav mics and uh, it fixed the problem. So he's been busy. He he's had some health issues that he's been, been dealing with. Uh, and so he also is very active playing uh, senior baseball league and, and uh, other kinds of stuff. And people really want his, his time to talk about dog fighting and Top Gun and so forth and so on. So we finally, our, our calendars overlapped and we were able to sit down and, and get it done. So that was this episode, the real Maverick. And here's where heater talks about how that image on the thumbnail influenced the producers of the original Top Gun to, to make the movie. Coming, coming back toward the ship and everybody was joining up and getting a little closer and I thought, wow, here's an island in the South China Sea. And look at these clouds. Aren't they the perfect background? And so I just took my Nikon and went as far back and I'm just in the mirror and looking at the camera and trying to see if I'm aiming at ducks, my Rio, and getting him centered. And I reach back and go, click. I got three pictures and one of them was what I, perfect for me. I mean, it was it was just perfect. So that photo ends up in a story about one of my wingmen. My wingman was was there, Yogi and Possum. And in California Magazine, uh, Ehud Yone wrote this whole article. He flew with them and, and did everything with with the Top Gun crew. And he wrote this story, but they needed a photo for the double spread start in California Magazine, and they used that one. So the producers of Footloose, Jerry Bruckheimer, Don Simpson, two young hotshot producers, they're in the dentist's office because Don Simpson has a toothache, and they do everything together so they could save time. Buy cars together, take meetings together, go to the dentist together, <laughs> shop for jeans together. They see the picture, and as Don and, and Jerry told me, Jerry, looked at it and he and he flopped it on Don's lap right next to him and said that looks like Star Wars on Earth that's our next movie that is a cool story that's another episode that's full of cool stories because heater's uh you know career path has had a lot of amazing things not just being part of Top Gun a fundamental part of of the original movie Top Gun but a Top Gun instructor flying the Migs before Constant Peg uh, and a bunch of other things. So uh, I'm real proud of that episode and, and glad we were able to document Heater's amazing life here on, on the channel. And we wish him the best health in the, uh, in the year to come. Another guy that we've had on the channel a, a number of times, and he's been a good sport with DCS and he's done, you know, how to land, how to dogfight. Uh, here in the Moochland facility flying my DCS simulator. Uh, but he also sat down and, and gave us his career, which I broke into a number of episodes, one about Sear School, and then this one, which was this amazing story, sea story, about this A6 bombardier navigator that, that ejected halfway out of an A6 intruder. So Nasty was the LSO that that waved uh, that that airplane coming aboard, and here's him recounting uh, what that what that was all about. He's a little bit high, and the airplane is cocked to the right because the parachute's wrapped around the tail. So I'm talking to him about his rudders, 
and talking to him about getting him back to centerland, talking to him about being high. Okay, bring it back to the left now. Boss, steady out right here. I'll take the wind. 30 knots, slightly left. Copy. Okay, flying just a little bit low. Roger. Steady out right here. Got 30 knots slightly poured. I'll take the wind, Cap. Steady up. Okay, just a little bit low. Roger. Just a little bit low. Come left. That paddle's talked down. I got you. Come a little bit left. A little bit of right rudder. A little bit of right rudder. Front center line. Front center line. A little right for a lineup. Don't go high. Don't go high. Attitude, attitude, attitude. As he crosses the ramp, I'm looking up at the airplane and I see Keith Gallagher's face. And it's his bare face. And he's leaned over looking at me, but his eyes are closed, like his head's leaned over. His arms are splayed back by the wind. He looks like a cross. But I had this instant feeling right when he goes to land. Oh my gosh, I don't want him to stop because he's going to come flying out and get run over. And we're going to watch him get run over. He doesn't because he's held back by the chute, wrapped around the tail, which has pulled him back into the back of his chute. And he's, he's pinned there. And I think he's dead. Well, you went down to sickbay to see him yeah. and he, he had a great line. Yeah, he did. I found out he's alive. I go down there to see him go running down to sickbay, racing over. The medics are sewing on his arm because he got it cut from the plexiglass here. He's all beat up, he's all bruised, and I lean over the top of the gurney and I look at him, and he's like, hey, Paddles. He goes, what'd you give my pilot? You know, his squinty eyes, and he's kind of hoarse and stuff from getting blown on. And I said, I gave him an okay underline. Of course he did great. And he goes, well, from where I was, he was high all the way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great, great story. So Nasty, another guy, had a fantastic career, retired as a two-star admiral. Um, I'm very flattered that that he's willing to uh, to talk to us multiple times. Another manifestation of the Channel Impact was this this trip I was invited to take up to the Massachusetts Air National Guard, uh, just north of Hartford, and um, they had seen my episode on the Army's fleet-wide grounding. And they asked if I could come give their lecture during their safety stand down. Uh, and I was just blown away by that. And they flew me up there and back in two different types of, uh, of prop planes. Uh, and uh, just really, they treated me super, super well. That's a part of the military that I'm not that familiar with. Uh, and these guys are total pros. And, and it, I just was really had a great time. And uh, so here's... Uh, the episode that I made was called Ungrounded. Here's a picture of me flying uh, in the airplane on our way back. Got to spend some time in the cockpit. And uh, I, here's part of that, that episode. If I can find it. <laughs> what your where your airplane is, is sus subject to the laws of physics um, and, and how sometimes maybe we're not fully cognizant of that in certain flight regimes. That was quick and dirty. It was. What do you think, Kurt? It was excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Carroll. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for the invite. It's good to be among the people out here doing it. Here's the airplane we're heading home in. This is a C-26, right? Metro liner, Metro liner. Texas liner. sewer pipe. Texas sewer pipe. San Antonio. Huh? <laughs> Stand corrected. Let's get Smile in your face
We're back here at Andrews. I'm with my pilot, John Hurley, who is also a fan of the channel. That's right. So um, he came up to me as we were leaving. A lot of pressure on me on that landing. Yeah, no, you, you what, nailed what do you it. Think? I've, it was fantastic. So, John, let me have some stick time. And so, this is a C 26. What's the nickname it, of the airport? It's a San Antonio sewer pipe. Was a San Antonio sewer pipe. Loving nickname. 80s, uh, it was an 80s. Interstate like commuter. Oh yeah, you know, okay. Small airlines. Crazy thing is certificated for 19 people, so Americans were a lot smaller in the, in the 80s. Yeah, I don't know. Said 19 I don't know how you would put 19 yeah. people. Yeah, but it's a cool airplane. What John showed me was the roll responses, like curling non 50 pound dumbbells. Yeah, yeah. So I got yeah, some big stick shoulders. Time. Yeah, big shoulders. Though. Right, right. So John, I hope to see you again. Yeah. Um, down the road here. He's given me a invite to come talk to the North Carolina Is it the guard or the yeah, North Carolina National Guard National Guard in December? They have their their uh, Safety stand safety down, stand down there. So uh, we've proved that the channel can leave my attic occasionally today. <laughs> we had a whirlwind time oh, nice but some real good good uh, Opportunities to, to say how the folks should mention John is a Apache driver by warfare trade, and, and you do this sort of uh, in well, between I'm, flying the I, I'm not flying the Apache anymore. I'm only flying this But you thing. have a lot of experience yeah. in the Apache. Every once in a while when they need an old guy, they'll bring me they, out of retirement. When they want the old guy out of the, off the bench, yeah, jump say, hey, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, my friend. Yeah, Fly safe. So what a blast that was. And I again, thanks to the Massachusetts Air National Guard for uh, allowing me to, to come up there. And they gave me a very cool, I don't know if you can see it, this statuette next to the, my ACDC horns on my helmet. It's a Minuteman, uh, really, really cool uh, trophy or memento, which I, I proudly display behind me here. Another thing that we did, we did a couple of episodes that were like global in terms of the the, the guest. And one was teed up by my good friend, former astronaut Scott Kelly, who's been on the channel uh, a few times. You guys can see Ingrid, the wonder dog, is, is up here. I guess the dogs are coming up. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Scott has a charity where they donate ambulances to uh, the Ukrainian citizens uh, to use, you know, in, for, for all the reasons they're needed over there. And so in the course of that, he, he met... Uh, Rebecca Masierowski, who is an American nurse who volunteered uh, to be a medic over there for a not-for-profit, and she's since pivoted to working directly with the uh, Ukrainian uh, military now. Uh, and I, I haven't talked to her in some time, but uh, I think she's still over there. So uh, here's an excerpt of Rebecca talking to us live from, from Kiev, where she was in, you know, behind uh, in, in the, the rear gear uh, for a few weeks, getting supplies and about to go back. So we were able to talk to her in Kiev. So here's here's part of that. So my background is nursing. Um, and I'm a registered nurse in uh, the United States and have worked overseas and in other countries, um, no active war zones in, until Ukraine and saw what was happening in March. And um, had, had been watching on the news, um, was employed in, in Colorado, and I had seen that the Ukrainian Ministry of Health had made an appeal to um, doctors and nurses to see if they could come and help in Ukraine. So I wrote to the Ministry of Health and I said, "Long here's a long shot, but I'm uh, a nurse in the United States and I'm wondering if you guys could use me. And they wrote back and said, yes, we could. So I got on a plane to Poland and I came over and um, found a volunteer paramedic battalion called the Hospitallers. And they have been doing um, 
sort of combat evacuations along with citizen evacuations since 2014. And so I joined up with them and started um, rotations um, out in the east and was able to help them with some pretty, pretty gnarly um, situations um, in which we had um, military and civilian casualties alike. And so kind of continued with them. And then while I was with them, I was able to work with the Ukrainian armed forces and kind of stayed with them um, and was able to work as, as their medic. So yeah, that's, that's kind of it. And so it's been, it's been a pretty remarkable journey. I feel very honored. So uh, amazing lady and uh glad that we were able to have her on and thanks to scott kelly for uh for facilitating that conversation so when we talk deep intel which is sort of a, a channel trademark the first thing that comes to my mind is our frequent guest paco benitez who was an f-15 strike eagle wizzo who was also in the procurement space so paco brings a, a hybrid set of skills and, and experiences that allow him to dive in on topics in, in a way that nobody else can. So every time he's on, uh, it's just chock full of, of facts and, and other sorts of gouge. So one of the episodes he did this year that was uh, really cool was the Deep Intel on the F-15 EX. So here's a clip from that yeah, again, episode. Look at the art of the possible and you start using your imagination um the the f-15 ex can carry a weapon up to 22 feet long and 7,000 pounds like a single weapon it can actually carry two of them uh, but let's say it can carry something that's that big uh, i just described the exact specifications of the aero hypersonic weapon that's carried by the p-52 when you look at the hyper uh, hypersonic attack cruise missile hackem that's a uh, a scramjet powered hypersonic that the air force is buying fits on the f-15 ex DARPA actually had a Mach 6 um, hypersonic that flew called High Fly, and it flew on 2005 on the F-15. There was actually a NASA program, believe it or not, that used a, a F-15B to, to use, uh, it basically was a modified AIM-54 to do Mach 5 hypersonic test bed. So we used to shoot those to go Mach 5 to test what hypersonic weapons would look like, and that was back in 2007. It's like, these aren't new things. So good, good stuff from Paco, always. The other thing that I enjoy about the channel is the ability to have lifelong friends on to tell their, their stories. And we, we started this early on with Reb Edwards and the other Tomcat guys particularly that I've, that, that I've had on. But this year we had Tom Page on, who's a Tomcat pilot who had a uh, night in the barrel that ended up with him barricading an F-14. And that was this episode, uh, which was uh, a lot of fun. And uh, Pager is a great storyteller. So um, here's an excerpt from that episode. Anyway, by the time we are briefing that, we're now back uh, on final bearing coming in and we get to around, I want to say maybe a mile and a half, two miles and LSOs come up and say, Go ahead, give me one more 360 here, Tom. And I'm thinking to myself, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> what? So, Are okay. you trying to make me flame out here? I mean, what are you guys doing? <laughs> right. No, exactly. So uh, as I start that turn, uh, I look down at the tapes, and now it's showing 900 pounds on the totalizer. And uh, I hadn't said a word outside the cockpit until that point. When I kind of did the, leaned over, keyed the UHF and said, and they immediately said, okay, turn. And they gave us the final bearing. So we were halfway through the turn when I said that, and they just said, keep it coming. So we turn, uh, we turn the final. And because of that, it was an overshooting start. Uh, so I was working a little bit right. So I got a, you know, fair amount of you know come left calls just because of the way 
the initial turn was. Yeah, really honk that line up, get her on center line way out there. Ricky called the ball with uh, 600 pounds. Okay, we got a clear deck, call the ball. Come on, Tom, that ball, 6 -0. Okay, run your ball. Flew the best pass I could, heard the cut, cut, cut calls. Cut, 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 cut. Dropped it to idle, uh, touched down, and kind of saw something, you know, we, we both kind of did a flinch because as the barricade engulfed the airplane, it was something. I didn't see it until it was there. Good barricade. Good engagement. Nice job, Major. All right, we have a dog festival going on here. Let me just put that down. <laughs> That's Decker. Carrie's going to take him outside for a second. Uh, so we won't be monitoring comments for a, for a little bit here. So that's a cool story that, that Pager tells well. And again, I'm, I'm very proud that, that that one has performed well in terms of uh, the view count. Speaking of Tomcats, as part of what we do on this channel is, is tell all different angles on the F-14. And this was uh, a particularly interesting one on how does the Iranian Air Force keep their their Tomcats airborne. And so um, here's part of that episode. Same time in 2006, the U.S. Navy retired its last F-14s, leaving Iran as the airplane's only operator, which heated up the parts war and caused the agents to take some dramatic steps, which included seizing four intact F-14s in California. Three at museums and one belonging to the producers of the military-themed TV show JAG, charging that the F-14s had not been properly stripped of useful parts that could wind up in Iranian hands. Congress was furious at the Pentagon for its lax handling of the Tomcat parts, and they passed a bill specifically banning any trade in F-14 components to Iran or any other entity. Then President George W. Bush signed that into law in 2008. The concern about parts falling into Iranian hands was so great that the Pentagon was also ordered to dismantle, crush, and shred more than 100 F-14s that were lined up at the Boneyard at davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona, which is something that no lover of legendary fighters wants to see. By 2008, Iranian Colonel Hasemi had spent almost two years in a Thai jail while Iran and the U.S. fought a heated legal battle over his extradition. Vincetti delayed his retirement so he could travel to Thailand and lay eyes on his adversary of sorts. Binchetti only saw Hasemi in a Thai courtroom and he described the Iranian as a tall man in his 50s with what he called a hardcore attitude, a true believer in the Islamic revolution. In September of 2008, the American extradition request was denied for a final time and Hasemi returned to Tehran where he was promoted to general. In early 2014, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security investigated another Israeli arms dealer saying that they had twice tried to send F-14 spare parts to Iran. And in what is maybe the weirdest part of this story, in late 2016, an aviation expert from Dallas named Eric Johnston discovered the hulks of two old F-14s on private land in Temple, Texas. According to the Houston Chronicle, those Tomcats somehow wound up there in the late 1980s after the government paid a contractor to scrap the two jets. And while Iran's aviation focus lately has pivoted from fighter jets to killer drones, which, oh, by the way, are built with embargoed American components, including semiconductors and weapons-grade inertial measurement units, the Iranian Air Force has kept flying the F-14. And in 2015, an Iranian news agency released photographs of the overhauled F-14s, claiming that the self-sufficiency jihad had been effective. According to Iranian sources, their engineers even managed to recreate the long-range Phoenix missile, rebranding it the Fakur. The sensitive avionics and computer components were also apparently re-engineered. And an image emerged that same year that had to warm the heart of any Tomcat fan, regardless of national allegiance. A pair of F-14s were seen over Syria, escorting a Russian-made Tu-95 on a bombing run. But as long as the Iranian Air Force is flying Tomcats, even with a self-sufficiency jihad or whatever, the underground market for Tomcat parts will exist. So another let's call it a genre within the channel is, is history. And one of our most popular episodes this year was this one about Operation Praying Manus when I was joined by another longtime friend, Brad Penniston, 
uh, who spoke about um, the uh, Operation Praying Mantis. He's now uh, fulfilled the, the requirement. He has visually ID'd the ship, and he's been met by hostile action. The, the ship fired at him, and so he he wings up. He attacks the ship, fires a, a harpoon at it, and while that harpoon's in the air, he gets a, que- a query from uh, uh, from I guess the Enterprise, who wants to know what his intentions are. And he's well, I've uh, you know my intention is to sink the ship. I've already fired a harpoon at it. I'm just waiting for it to hit. And so he that does hit. And he follows up with some 500 pounders. One of those hits the bridge. He sees it, you know, take the bridge out. So he figures, okay, that ship is is neutralized, to put it mildly. So DCAG Langston, RTBs back to Enterprise. Meanwhile, another SAM class frigate is detected. That's right. And this this one is the Sabalan. And the Sabalan had a particular reputation in the Gulf. Its captain was known for well-nigh atrocities on the high seas. Some Iranians would allow you to get off your tanker before they sank it. The captain of the Sabalan was not known for, for such niceties. His nickname on the radio was Captain Nasty. Captain Nasty. So Brad did a great job. He... Uh works at Defense One, a great media outlet. And he also was also at military.com where I was the editor. We didn't overlap, but he was, was one of the original staff there at, at, at that great website. The other thing that we did history-wise this year, and this was the most popular episode recorded this year. It was not the most popular episode uh, overall, but the most popular episode uh, recorded this year was this one about the Kuznetsov. And in this episode, I documented my experience with the Kuznetsov on that ship's first deployment and how the crew of Kuznetsov came over to the USS America and uh, the the air show that we put on for them that, that kind of overwhelmed them, to be honest. So here's that excerpt. I was the operations officer for VF-102, the Diamondbacks, deployed aboard the USS America, CV-66 at that time, for what was the final cruise of that great aircraft carrier. Early in the deployment, we conducted strikes against the Serbs who were laying siege to Sarajevo, and we were successful in breaking that siege. But one day, the 6th Fleet Staff announced that we were hosting high-ranking officers from Kuznetsov, including their embarked Admiral Igor Kazatonov and Sukhoi's chief test pilot. We sent three of our SH-60s to pick them up. The Seahawk crews later mentioned that Kuznetsov looked tired for a relatively new ship and the interior spaces smelled like the plumbing wasn't working. They also said they only saw one Su-33 on the flight deck and it appeared to be broken. So once the Russian VIPs got aboard America, we wowed them with a 30-plane launch, including one Diamondback Tomcat piloted by the squadron's XO with the Sukhoi chief test pilot in the back seat. I was on the wing of that jet flying with a first tour lieutenant named Tad Templeton. Here's a photo of us trapping back aboard at the end of that cycle, and you can see a Russian Savremini class destroyer off of America's port side. In the debrief with the Russians in the VF-102 ready room, the Sukhoi test pilot gushed, to fly with the Diamondbacks is the greatest day of my life. And Admiral Kasatonov was having a nicotine fit. His interpreter used the expression that the Admiral's ears were curling, so our skipper let him fire up a smoke, although it was against U.S. Navy regulations at that time. It was obvious from the reaction of all the Russians present that our demonstration had the intended effect. Remember, America was not a nuke boat and was 30 years old at that time and about to be retired, but still had amazing sortie generation capabilities. That had to be demoralizing for the Kuznetsov crew, whose brand new boat was anchored off of Syria, unable to perform basic functions like making drinkable water, not to mention conducting any meaningful number of flight ops. I was the operator. So that was one of the most noteworthy times of my time on active duty, that that cruise uh, on America. Additionally, we we were fighting the Bosnian War of 95-96, got the Serbians to move out of Sarajevo. We broke the siege. And the squadron I was in, VF-102, flew record, record sorties. And we won the Battle E, the Safety S, and the Clifton that year. Uh, so that was really uh, an amazing, amazing cruise. And obviously that that interface with the Russians was uh, 
pretty amazing. And the fact that we were able to uh, launch 50 sorties on, on one of the oldest aircraft carriers was not lost on those guys. It probably set their carrier aviation timeline back a few, a few decades. Another unorthodox and um, kind of amazing thing that we got involved with was helping these former Afghan air force pilots get out of Islamabad and hopefully relocate to the United States. So these guys did the hard jobs, just like the interpreters uh, who worked with us during our 20 years in Afghanistan. They had the right kind of motivation and were in it to try to make Afghanistan prosper and become a, a free nation. That was their, uh, their motivation. And as is obviously uh, one of our more dubious circumstances, uh, the rate at which we left uh, a couple of years ago left guys like this hanging. And so I was approached by a retired admiral who got involved with fundraising and also working with the State Department to try to get these pilots, these Afghan pilots, out of Islamabad, where they're not safe, back to the States. And so we were able to arrange a conversation with two of the pilots. And as a function of that uh, and your support, uh, we were able to raise almost $40,000 which I've heard back from this admiral and some of the other organizers of this effort. Uh, and it's, it's made all the difference. And we expect that they'll uh, be back in the States uh, very soon. And I'll keep everybody posted as to when that, when that actually happens. Um, so this episode was called Trapped. And let me play you the excerpt. Afghan government fell uh, on uh, 15 August uh, 2021. I was in duty. I was inside the airport with my friends. All the forces uh, were down except the Afghan Air Force. The Afghan Air Force uh, continued their duty until the end of the day. Inside the airport was uh, U.S. forces and outside the airport was Taliban. We stayed inside the airport for two days without food and without water. So after two days, we decided to go outside to find some food, for some water. And I went outside. I went to my, uh, my friend's house. Uh, after two days, I decided to enter the airport. And when I came and I showed my documents, there was a soldier of Taliban, I showed my document to him. He realized that I'm a pilot, a military pilot, he told me, you fight against us for 20 years. Now it's time for revenge. And then he shoot me and the, he hit uh, my upper leg. And I got high injury and I fall down. Then my friend took me to the hospital. After that, I left the airport and I go back home. How about you, Tamim? What was your situation when Kabul was falling? As we heard the uh, rumors that the Taliban are entering the city, uh, we said that we are ready to uh, fly and uh, do, do not let them to enter the city, but the leaders did not let us, and uh, they said, no, it's not the time now. And uh, we were inside the airport uh, that night that the uh, fall down happened. We went to the other side of the uh, runway, and uh, the, the U.S. forces uh, were uh, supporting us there uh, in order to evacuate us but uh, early in the morning uh, they left us uh, and uh, we didn't see much choice and then we came back to the other side of the runway to the military side and uh, uh, we were waiting for evacuation to get on board of the aircraft and all at once the uh, civilian paper people entered the runway and uh, the chaos happened and we didn't have much choice inside the civilian people also there were Taliban so we left the airport so amazing individuals brave men and uh, here's hoping that uh, we're able to get them back stateside and their families as well 
they 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 earned our consideration in the, in that regard. The other thing that we do on the channel occasionally is UFO episodes, and this year uh, did four or five of them, uh, particularly around the hearings that happened on the Hill. Uh, I did one with with Sunshine, you guys may have seen, where we analyzed the hearing and sort of sliced and diced the the three uh, guys on the the, the three panelists, uh, witnesses, as it were. Um, and, and also one I did was Stephen Greer, who is a UFO ufologist. Uh, so that was this episode. And here's the excerpt from that episode. But since 1993, the organization that's been persistently trying to shine a light on the UFO phenomenon more than any other is the Disclosure Project, headed by a man named Stephen Greer. Before Greer became a ufologist, he worked as an emergency room physician. After his second UFO encounter, he began to research how the U.S. government was dealing with the possible existence of alien life forms. And in the process of that research, he started to grow a database of people who claimed to have also had encounters with UFOs. He founded the Disclosure Project as a nonprofit with the mission to make the White House, Congress, the Pentagon, and the general public aware of and concerned with what the organization labels as a crisis more serious than any military threat we're aware of. Earlier this week, Dr. Greer spoke at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., and he started his remarks with why the Disclosure Project is ramping up their intensity now. And it's because what he calls official law created over the last year or so is that Congress has mandated that the Pentagon, specifically the intelligence community, research the UFO crisis and report back to them. Adopting that mandate for itself, this week the Disclosure Project handed both Congress and AARO at the Pentagon a list of 145 top secret facilities and bases, 700 152 witnesses from the military, defense sector, and government agencies, and 121 UFO crash retrieval case documents. He also submitted stats like 122 vehicles have come down and 60 to 70 extraterrestrial vehicles have been recovered over the last 80 years. But since 19... So we'll, we'll cover UFO stuff when, when it it's appropriate. I, you know, everybody, every time I do a UFO episode, UFO episode, people are like, don't make this into a UFO channel. I, I got it. Uh, but um, I, I think insofar as it equals U S air force and aviation and technology, because the whole Tic Tac thing, uh, you know, it's part of what we've wondered aloud about is, is this a next generation technology that we're being, um, exposed to right and again the analog for that is the area 51 origination and how that was used with the u2 and the a12 i started that episode the the deep intel on on area 51 thinking it would be about aliens and and rumors and conspiracy theories and as i did the research i realized that this is very much about the development of a very important Cold War capability. Also, what jumped out at me is the reports that the authorities got during those years about craft that were up at 70, 80,000 feet. So if I'm an airline pilot flying around in 1955 at 35,000 feet, and I look up and I see this thing glinting at 70,000 feet. I'm like, there's nothing that can go at 70,000 feet. So I'll go LA Center, United 405. I see something. I'd like to make a report. And then once this airplane goes public, once it's you know no longer a classified program, then you're like, oh, okay, that's what I saw. Same drill with the A-12, same drill with the F-117. You know, a lot of people saw that black triangle that looks completely unairworthy and they're the only explanation was a UFO, what we now know as a UAP. So um, those stories are appropriate to us covering them. And, and so as these testimonies happen and as the UAP and other agencies start to reveal things and Congress demands information, uh, we'll, we'll cover it. But I, I, you have my promise that I will not make this into a, a UFO channel. Another current event this year, it seems a long time ago now, involved the Wagner Group and Prigozhin, uh, who, who 
we all know died uh, some weeks after uh, this particular incident. So to give us the lowdown on what was going on at this time, I reached out to my good friend, Bill Hamlet, who is the editor in chief of Proceedings Magazine at the Naval Institute. And I asked Bill to talk about his experience as the naval attache in Moscow. And, and so here's, here's what he, uh, he told us. It's a, a, a army major who he and I went through three months of attache school together. He had been on the strategic um, arms limitation talks teams, SALT and START. So he'd been an, uh, an arms inspector. So, you know, U.S. teams would go over and, and inspect Russian ICBM silos and SLBMs and all those things for treaty compliance. And then he had done a tour in Belarus, so speaking Russian. And then now he was going to, uh, he was actually going to go to Moldova for his uh, DAT tour there. But, we, but he'd had a lot of experience with the Russians. And, uh, and he says, hey, you're going to be fine. Um, just remember, they're Klingons. And I remember thinking, what? And he goes, you know, Star Trek. He says, that's how different the Russians are from the United States. Just, just keep that in mind. Federation, US, US, NATO, it's the Federation. Russians, they're Klingons. And just all, if you ever wonder why they're doing something, just run, that, run it through that filter in your <laughs> mind, right? And, and it was absolutely true. Like there were a number of times where I would say, oh my God, why are the Russians? It, and that was a good time that I was there, right? There was a good relationship. There was a desire on both parts to do more, to do more you know, military um, engagement. Uh, Putin and Bush were on you know, not just speaking terms, but they liked each other, at least um, uh, on the surface, right? And, uh, and yet there were times when things were very frustrating and I would go, oh my God, I don't understand why the Russians are doing this. And I would remember uh, my friend, the army major saying they're Klingons. And then I would I'd put that filter on it and I'd say, okay, yep, it works. Now I understand it. I so understand for the non-Trekkies in the viewership here, right. what, what does that mean? There are, there are hard people, they're, they're, they're not compassionate, they don't they're, they're, uh, they're know, very they live hard. by the golden rule. What, what does that mean? Another way of looking at it is if it there is no, there is no win-win in Russian thinking, right? It is almost always zero-sum game. So they tend to look at the world through: if it's good for you, then it must be bad for me, right? Whereas Americans, we're always looking for the: hey, you're my friend, let's yeah, do this yeah. together. It'll be good for both of us. And the Russians have a very cynical a uh, attitude towards things. And so, if something's good for you, then it must be bad for them. So that was good stuff from, from retired Navy Captain Bill Hamlet, who I worked with at the Naval Institute uh, for, for five years. And he's, he's the editor-in-chief of Proceedings Magazine, doing a fantastic job. Uh, if you are not aware of what the Naval Institute is all about, I would check it out. It's been around since 1873, a great organization that is about the sea services and uh, promotion and furtherance of the sea services, meaning U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. Uh, located on the Naval Academy grounds, founded by Admiral Warden, for whom the drill field is named on the Naval Academy grounds. But Admiral Warden, when he was Captain Warden, was CEO of the USS Monitor during the Civil War. And when he was uh, the superintendent in the years that followed the Civil War, he was not happy with the direction that the U.S. Navy was going in the wake of the Civil War. And so they created the Naval Institute to influence all the right people to get the U.S. Navy back where it needed to be. Um, so thanks to Bill for, for spending some time uh, with us in that episode. The other big news this year, in addition to the submersible imploding, so we've covered some current events and we thought that would be the thing that would be in focus for months and months and it was generally eclipsed by something else. And in this case, the air show mishap over uh, a small lake in Michigan. This is a, what is it called? Thunder over Michigan air show that involved a MiG-23. Uh, so covered some of this in the, uh, the initial report. Um, so here's that excerpt.
go to the training aids. Let's say we're flying around on an F-14 and, and we hear a bang or the airplane rolls off uncommanded. The first question I would ask is the Rio is, do you got it? If the pilot says, yeah, hold on here, then I'm not initiating ejection at that point. And in the F-14 anyway, there are a couple reasons I would not eject at that point. The first is, I have no idea if the pilot is ready to eject. So if he's troubleshooting the problem, as he just told me he was, and he's heads down looking at a gauge or his telelight panel or searching for a circuit breaker, and I initiate ejection, he could sustain severe damage to his neck or back. The second reason is, in the back of the F-14, I didn't have engine instruments. I had a fuel totalizer. I could see the stall warning lights over his shoulder. I had an airspeed indicator, so if we were slowing down, I would know, and I'd also feel it. But if he's saying, I'm troubleshooting an engine problem, my move is to find my pocket checklist, find the appropriate engine malfunction steps, and start to back him up. So I think in the case of the MiG-23, the pilot-rated observer's experience, and maybe his perceived situational awareness based on the gauges he saw, was a liability and mitigated good crew coordination. I do not want to get ahead of the facts or prejudge the conduct of the crew, but based on the wording in this report, that's the way it strikes me. So there'll be more to follow this year on, on that, that topic when the final report comes out. Um, and uh, not to tease it out too much, but uh, the other guy in the airplane, uh, his, his point of view is considerably different than the guy in the backseat. And you'll remember that I also did an episode about another channel where the observer in the back seat uh, went public with his version of the story, which which kind of struck me as a party foul. And I know others in the space also were not uh, happy with that, but there's more to follow on that particular story. Another story that was a big deal at the time was when these SU-27s hit an American drone uh, flying over the, the Black Sea. And here's the excerpt from that episode. So let's analyze this new video footage. So we see the first flanker coming at the drone. They're flying the same direction. Dumps are on. Gets close enough to disturb the camera. But that one didn't hit. Now here's the second pass, different sun angle. So the airplane has turned a little bit. Dumps on. And there's the collision makes the camera go to color bars. And then you can see the propeller is now damaged. And again, they ditched the drone as a result of that damage. So that was a pretty cool episode. And this is one of those things where the content sort of makes my job easy when Divids or whomever puts out that kind of footage uh, we do these current events episodes and, and just sort of provide some analysis around it. So that that one was uh, uh, was an easy day, as we say. Um, so another big deal early in the year in terms of current events was the Chinese spy balloon situation. So, you know, that this, it seemed like every day I was doing another episode about another shoot down. There were two with F-22s and there was one with an F-16 over Lake Huron, uh, all using sidewinders. But it was it was it started to become a problem with keeping up with uh, with what version of this we're talking about. Not unlike the Houthi situation in the Red Sea and the uh, Gulf of Aden that we're dealing with these days. Uh, but the first one I did uh, was one of my more popular episodes of of the the year. It had 1.2 million views, and it it reached that number in about 36 hours. Uh, so here is the excerpt from that one. Video shot from the ground in coastal South Carolina. You can see the contrails of the Raptor and then the contrail of the Sidewinder at trigger squeeze. The missile trail disappears as the weapon guides and the rocket motor stops firing and you can see the balloon shape distort as the missile hits. At the time of the shot, the balloon was higher than the jet, flying between 60,000 and 65,000 feet. The missile hit at the base of the balloon, and the spy rig immediately fell away and continued to shed panels as it fell toward the water. Using the Raptor's gun would have been cheaper, of course, but would have induced risk because the range for a gun's kill is around 1,000 feet instead of over 2 miles for the AIM-9X, 
and the dispersion of the bullets would have damaged the spy gear more than a single missile did. Basically, the Air Force chose to use an arrow instead of a shotgun. For the record, the Chinese balloon is the first air-to-air -air kill for the F-22, a twin-engine stealth fighter originally built to battle Russian fighters. So, again, that, that was something that we thought would be dominating the, the news uh, in, in a way that ultimately it just kind of went away. You know, I mean, are balloons an issue anymore? Did I, I heard that the national radar grid just raised the filter so that the balloons just weren't seen, you know, uh, it just kind of, kind of went away. Uh, but we'll be keeping our eyes on it in the event that there is a balloon. And as I said, with the shoot down of drones and missiles from the Houthis by TAC air, the analog for using TAC air to shoot down slow flyers or things that are sort of passive, let's just say, uh, is those balloon shoot, shoot downs. And that's why I imagine that, uh, what those Super Hornets used was was Sidewinders. Um, the other thing we tried to keep our eye on this year, which became a challenge in the face of the post-October 7th circumstance, was the war in Ukraine. And of course, when we're talking war in Ukraine, uh, we generally turn to our good friend Justin Bronk, uh, and such was the case this year when we were talking about the F-16s and whether they were going to get them or not, the Ukrainians were going to get them and, and what that was going to uh, to yield. So here's Justin uh, with his thoughts on that particular issue. In the pilots, which a lot of the debate is focused on in public, has always been the easy bit. You can train pilots on any jet. F-16 is fairly easy to train people on as they go. It's easy to physically fly. The, the interface is, is pretty friendly. Um, the HOTAS, is, the hands-on throttle and stick, is very nice. For Ukrainian pilots who are highly skilled, they've done a lot of combat operations, they're used to flying in much more difficult jets to physically fly and operate. Yes, you could train the pilots pretty quickly to convert onto F-16. The issue has always been setting up the maintenance chain getting a maintenance infrastructure and and the personnel involved in place to actually allow Ukraine to operate these things in country. People who don't work in fighter procurement circles or, or haven't been on fighter squadrons do not understand how complicated this is as a thing to do. And it's also markedly more complicated on almost all Western types than it, than it is for the MiG-29s, Sukhoi-27s, uh, Sukhoi-24s, 25s that the Ukrainians are used to because the Russian or Soviet design philosophy was you basically don't do depth maintenance. Um, they're very robust. You do relatively simple servicing on base. And then if something big breaks, you just send it back to the factory. They send you a new one in the interim and it gets repaired at the factory. So there was less fixing really complicated stuff. Um, and also just the design philosophy is different in terms of all of the, the way the internals and the avionics suites and things work. Now, it's not to say the Ukrainians couldn't do it. Of course they could do it. Um, but it will take time to train uh, maintainers. I mean, it will take years to train people who can not just do the basic maintenance under supervision, but to be journeymen, as the, U as the US model would see it, let alone master, master um, maintainers who can sign off on things. Uh, you know, Justin is uh, is money, and uh, we've been lucky to have him at our disposal since the Ukraine, uh, since Russia invaded Ukraine last year, two years ago. Okay, we're getting close to the uh, the awarding of the Moochies. Another thing that we did this year, and just like it, it you know, the channel is not a UFO channel. It's it's. Also, not only a news channel, you know, I'll, I'll do current events uh, when it feels right for us. It's not a every news cycle, every day, uh, daily reportage kind of a, a situation. I'm, I'm trying to do all sorts of the things that we do, history, interviews, uh, celebrate the profession, celebrate the, the aircraft through history. I'm working on an episode about Billy Mitchell. Uh, who's a guy that uh, needs more 
uh, attention from the casual viewer. Uh, he, you know, you can thank Billy Mitchell for the aircraft carrier, really. And his trial uh, was pretty amazing. Not unlike the revolt of the admirals in 1947. Uh, this is a, a similar era in the 1920s, where when people say, you know, the military is so political these days, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Look at the 20s. Look at the 40s. And, you know, get kind of a grip. So if you don't understand history, then everything seems new and everything seems intense and so forth and so on. Uh, so I'm going to focus on all these things at once. But the current events issues uh, have done very well in terms of, of numbers. Uh, and also it allows me to do shorter form content like today is a good example. That That's a, a five minute episode uh, about the H-60s uh, taking out those Houthi uh, small boats and having the H-60 join the fight is why I, because I woke up this morning working on the assets for this live stream. And then that came across my desk. I'm like, okay, this is a new wrinkle in what is really an ongoing proxy war. You know, America versus the Iranian proxies is a thing that's almost distinct from the Israel Hamas circumstance. It, it's a separate thing. Uh, and, and it's growing in a way that uh, we need to keep our, our focus on it. And the U.S. Navy and parts of the U.S. Navy that are sort of shining and, and showing that they're ready are surface warfare, the small boys, particularly the Arleigh Burks. But that also includes the, the Alpha Whiskey and the folks on the cruisers. In the case of the uh, Eisenhower Strike Group, it is the Philippine Sea. And then today it was the, the Rotary Wing guys. Um, you know, launching both off of the Eisenhower and the, the small boys uh, that, that are in company. So everybody is contributing in a way that is as designed and seldom gets put into practice in this way. So we will definitely be covering all of, all of these sorts of things. So the Ford moving from the Adriatic to East Med at, in the wake of the October 7th uh, attack and then Ike, not going on cruise early, but going on cruise and what were the options for Ike were episodes that I did back to back. And this is the only time in the history of the channel I've had two episodes in a row get more than a million views back to back. Um, so I just took that as a signal that people are interested in my take on current events. And so I will continue to do them insofar as I think it's distinct from whatever else other smarter YouTubers, more relevant YouTubers, um, like Sal uh, Mercagliano is a good example of if, if X equals commercial shipping, that's Sal's lane. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do a talk about, you know, Maersk and, and, and the, the other shipping situations and how much does it cost to go through the Suez Canal for a tanker or a container ship. That's what Sal does. I, I'm, thankful that Sal came on and, and gave me uh, his interpretation of some of what's going on. But I'm not going to come out of my lane uh, because there's some idea that it might that episode might be popular. I think what you'll see from me is I'll stick to what I do, and I may be doing more and more uh, current events insofar as I feel like that's mine to do. So here's uh, the episode about, or here's an excerpt of the episode of Ike joining Ford. Now that the carrier is underway for the deployment, the first thing it will do is hang off the coast of the U.S. for a couple of days as the air wing flies aboard and pilots reestablish their carrier landing currency both during the day and at night. Once that's done, the airplanes will be chained to the deck and stowed in the hangar bay, and the ship will transit east for five or six days without conducting any flight ops. During that time, the maintainers will work on the airplanes, and the air crew will conduct training and do mission planning. Once Ike is within divert range of the Azores, the air wing will start flying again. As the Eisenhower Strike Group passes through the Straits of Gibraltar, they'll enter the Sixth Fleet area of responsibility. Sixth Fleet is currently commanded by Vice Admiral Thomas Ishii, and he'll give the order for where Ike will go. There are basically three options. Backfill Ford Station in the Adriatic in support of NATO's operations associated with the war in Ukraine, join the Ford in the Eastern Med, or keep going through the Med, southward through the Suez Canal and eventually into the North Arabian Sea and Persian Gulf as a signal to Iran.
So, um, again, that those episodes have done well, uh, and I, I have my lane, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, eager to continue to to cover these events insofar as uh, it fits for with what we're doing. Okay, now the the time has come. So before we get into awarding the Moochies, let me thank all of you for showing up on New Year's Eve. This is becoming an annual uh, sort of thing. Let me thank Mrs. Mooch for joining me here. Where are you? How come you're not coming up? I don't know. <laughs> let me see if I can't get you. There we go. Happy, Happy New, New Year, everybody. everybody. Be safe out there. Cheers to 2024. So let's let's thank Carrie for working the gains of the uh, the comments. That's why we've had so many comments on you know during the course of this. Uh, thanks to everybody for showing up. 735 folks on New Year's Eve. That's a great great number. That's I think twice as many as we had last year for our, our live stream. Um, I know I see, I've seen Sparky do a couple of comments. Sparky, I'm wearing my Tomcat stud because you gave me grief last year for not doing so. Um, I've modified my tuxedo. Obviously, this is what I'm calling a fluxedo, a flight jacket with a tuxedo uh, shirt and tie. Uh, so in any case, this will be an annual uh, thing that we do. And uh, the highlight of this, besides the highlights that I just went through, is the awarding of the Moochies. So the first Moochie is for guest of the episode with the most views. So if you look at the thumbnails over the last year, this isn't a surprise. I will add the proviso, which is it has to be an episode that was recorded this year. Because if you look at just episodes that if you don't consider what year was it recorded, um, Casey Campbell's episode is, is a perennial favorite. But this was the episode that was the most popular of the ones recorded this year. And it was the Praying Mantis episode here. And so the Moochie goes to my good friend, Bradley Penniston. And here is Brad's acceptance speech. nice surprise. I want to thank Ward for having me on the show. I want to thank everybody who clicked and watched the video about the uh, the Operation Praying Mantis. Um, I'd like to recognize the sailors and the soldiers and the airmen marines who participated in the battle. Uh, and I'd also like to recognize the men of the USS Samuel B. Roberts, the Navy frigate that hit the mine that precipitated this whole thing. Um, if you want to know more about uh, Praying Mantis and the Roberts, I think the best way is probably to buy my book. No Higher Honor. It came out in 2006 from Naval Institute Press. It tells the story of the forging of the ship and its crew and how they prepared for their moment of mortal peril. It's, uh, it's a terrific book and I think that uh, everybody should... Awesome stuff. Congratulations, Brad, and we hope to have you on again in the coming year. So now, guest of the year, the Moochie for guest of the year. So we had some close competition this year, and if you guys remember during one episode, the AI episode, Paco Benitez laid down a, a, a marker, a challenge. I want a Moochie this year. I want a Moochie. Okay, then we're going to have to have you on a bunch. I'm working on it. I'm brute right, forcing well, my way to victory. Well, you might have an advantage because Justin's been on the road. I um, mean, we haven't been able to pin him down. So uh, I think it's going to be a jump ball for the Moochie this year. So, okay, I like your motivation. I'm liking it. So, unfortunately, Paco fell short of having the most views across all of his appearances this year. Uh, so we look forward to Paco perhaps earning the Moochie next year. Paco, you got to be available a little more. Uh, but we are looking forward to having Paco on in, in the near future. He's a busy man. But 
Our winner this year is actually a repeat. And I know some of you aren't terribly surprised. Justin Bronk. So for the second year in a row, Justin Bronk is our guest of the year. The total of the views across all of his appearances was more than 1.4 million views. And here is Justin's acceptance speech. I'm delighted to win the the Moochie uh, again in, in for 2023. Uh, the previous uh, year's Moochie is, is sitting with pride of place uh, as part of my kind of um, swag or souvenirs um, collection from from travels and things. Uh, so I'm, I'm very very honoured that there'll there'll be another one. Um, it's been really nice uh, meeting a few of you uh, out and about in, in the US, UK and elsewhere who've, who've kind of been kind enough to come up and say that you uh, enjoy watching the interviews. And um, yeah, it, it means a lot. Um, I mean, obviously, horrendously awkward about accepting any compliment being British. But uh, but yeah, um, I, I enjoyed um, the conversations. Uh, Ward's always a great interviewer. Um, really good fun and uh, enjoy looking through the comments, um, most of them anyway, uh, after after views, uh, after interviews. So, yeah, uh, looking forward to doing more in 2024 and hopefully there'll be some some more encouraging and, and kind of positive uh, news in world events to to discuss um, next year. Uh, have a have a happy new year, everyone. And um, yeah, thanks very much for, for watching and, and for the feedback. So congratulations, Justin, uh, first two-time winner of the Moochie for Guest of the Year. Uh, if you've looked at the comments associated with his episodes, because the war in Ukraine is a polarizing conflict and getting more so, uh, Justin takes his lumps. But as you see there, he's a big boy and uh, he's not faking his point of view. Uh, his expertise is something that I will always welcome uh, on the channel. So we'll see him again in the in the year to come. So we have reached the end of the uh, the live stream. So again, thanks to everyone for for joining us. Uh, this is going to be a challenging year, but this community that we've created uh, will be able to uh, sort of face it together as it were. Uh, we'll look for uh, providing a balanced point of view, whatever proprietary information we get, uh, we'll, we'll get it to you guys in a, in a timely fashion. All of this is a function of subscribing. And I'd like to give a particular shout out to my patrons uh, who have been super loyal and have become some of my best friends. And you, you see them in the comments uh, here. Uh, and I will look forward to seeing them again in person if not before, at the at Muchapalooza here in Annapolis on July 13th. So we will be providing information on, on that annual event, which is a celebration of the channel and all of those who support the channel each year here in Annapolis. So more to follow on that. But for now, let me... Got Last year I had McAllen 15. Now I've got Glenlivet. Let me... Pour one out for those deployed and those in harm's way. And here's a toast to good times next year and peace on earth. Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks for showing up. And we will see you guys again soon. Thanks again, Carrie, for the help. Happy. I love you. Love you, Love you too. too. Bye. Bye, guys.